is uh, Kenny Patton, for those of you who don't know already. I'm an academic uh, at Royal Holloway University of London. And uh, for my sins, I'm a co-chair of the CFRG, um, and I'll explain in a moment what CFRG is. I think most of you, if you've got this far in the week and you're actually here, sitting here, you probably already know what CFRG is. So I'll explain anyway. And the sheet is circulating, so there are two copies. If you could sign one of them, please, and pass it along, that would be really great. Okay, so the agenda for today, I'm going to give a bit of a, um, an overview of CFRG uh, and talk about what we're doing with various documents. Then we'll have three presentations um, each one with discussion. The first one will be by Shai Garon, and he's going to talk about AES GCM SIV, uh, 30 minutes presentation plus 10 minutes of discussion. Then Joel Alwan is going to speak about memory hard functions, uh, same format, and then we'll have a shorter presentation from Andres, Andres Hilsing about uh, hash-based signatures, about specifically the scheme that is currently making its way through uh, our process, um, and actually almost there. And then at the end, we'll have 10 minutes for AOB, uh, and in that se section, perhaps we could discuss whether this has, this has been useful for the academics in the room and if, this, if it's the kind of thing you would like to see more of. And then we'll finish at 3.30. And we'll get thrown out at 3.30 because they need to start disassembling the room. Okay, so um, maybe I can go over this very quickly. You're all here. You all know that this thing is the internet. You know that IETF and IRTF are responsible for making sure it works. And the CFRG, Crypto Forum Research Group, is one of the research groups of the IRTF that supplies crypto advice to the IETF, okay? And here's a little extract from our charter. Um, I'll give you a few seconds to read that. It basically says, this is what we're in motion to do. This is what we're trying to do. A general forum discussing and reviewing uses of cryptographic mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera, okay? To offer guidance on the use of emerging mechanisms and new uses of existing mechanisms. Okay, so it's pretty broad. Good. Um, so CFRG normally meets at IETF meetings, and these meetings are held three times a year at a variety of locations. The last one was in Buenos Aires in uh, Argentina. The next one will be in Berlin uh, in Germany in July. And there's a whole schedule going out to 2027 or something of these meetings uh, three times a year. A lot of work is also carried out on the CFRG mailing list. That's an online that's a mailing list that you can join and you can contribute to. It's completely open. You can sign up online. So formally what this is, um, it's an interim meeting. So we have this capability, plenty of seats at the front, guys. We have this capability to um, have interim meetings if there's a specific topic of interest or if we want to broaden the, the set of people who are involved in CFRG, okay? So this informally today is an experiment to try to increase academic engagement in CFRG and to figure out whether uh, it's a model that's worth pursuing. Uh, maybe we could co-locate with key academic conferences each year, maybe with CCS or maybe with crypto, for example. Probably not with TCC, though. Okay, that was a joke, by the way. All right. So the, for those of you who came late, the sign-in sheet is circulating. Just, just put your name and your organization there, please. I, I'm required to get a formal record of who's here. Fine. Um, the way that we work is we develop documents. They start off as internet drafts. They would be adopted by CFRG, which means they get looked after by CFRG and pushed through the process. You can see all of the documents that CFRG is currently managing at that, at that link. Um, these slides and all of the other presentations and slides should be available online already. Unfortunately, the system isn't quite working. Um, I, I've uploaded them all, but somehow you cannot actually download them currently. So I apologize for that. Um, but most of these you can find online in other places. So we have a selection of drafts here that are currently being sponsored by CFRG, including uh, AES GCM SIV, which we formally adopted a few weeks ago, including uh, some signature schemes based on EDDSA, which are actually nearly complete and will be very useful for the TLS working group. We're also starting up some work on, on password authentic key exchange. So we're trying to figure out what a PAKE should do first before we start standardizing any. And then finally, as we'll hear later from Andreas, um, we've got some hash-based signature schemes. So we're starting to get into the post-quantum world as well and think about security there. And a major success recently was the publication of RFC 7748. So this is an output of this working of this research group, which specifies uh, elliptic curves, including a curve 25519 and a 448 bit curve, which will be adopted in TLS 1.3 and hopefully will become very widely used in future. So this is an example of something that's gone through our process and is now available as, a, as an internet standard, as an RFC. 
Okay. Um, also, we're going to set up, or we're in the process of setting up something called the CFRG review panel. And this is an attempt to, to formalize and to supplement the normal CFRG review processes. Um, this is an idea that's currently under discussion on the mailing list, so feel free to, to contribute there and give us your opinions on whether this is a good idea or a bad idea. We expect the workload for people who are on the review panel, so people will be appointed for a term, maybe three years, would be to review one or two documents a year, write a little report summarizing uh, the, the qualities of the document, making recommendations about how it should be taken forward, okay? And so the chairs, that's me and Alexei Melnikov, are looking for volunteers or nominations for volunteers um, to join the panel. So if you're interested in getting involved in that part of our work, uh, please come talk to me. I hope the workload will not be very high, but I hope that the, the output of those reviews will be very valuable to CFRG. Okay, so that's about everything I wanted to say in my little introductory uh, uh, section. Um, are there any comments or questions about that? Um, let me just mention that for comments and questions, uh, you should really take the mic, so physically come and take the mic and state your name and then make your, make your comment. That's how we'll handle it throughout the whole meeting. That's how things are done in IETF, IRTF. So if you have any comments or questions about what I've said so far. Okay, well then, we'll move straight on uh, to Shai Geron, who's going to talk for half an hour about AES, GCM, SIV. Let me give you the mic. All right, so good afternoon to everyone. I'm talking about uh, ASGCM CIV, that's how we call it, and this is joint work with uh, Adam Langley from Google and Yuda Lindel from uh, Barilan uh, University. All right, so I'll start with what it is in a nutshell, and then we'll get into some of the gory details. So what, what it is is a full non-misuse resistant authenticated encryption at an extremely low cost. And I'll explain what the, the low cost means here. We get the performance, almost the same performance as AES GCM. And uh, furthermore, by design, it can enjoy any optimization that AES GCM can enjoy. This uh, companion GCM sieve can also enjoy. I say almost, and I'll just detail exactly wha what is the only thing that it cannot enjoy. And uh, it has a full uh, proof of security, full implementation, and uh, we are going to post very soon updated uh, security margins, actually showing that the security margins are even better than uh, those for ASGCM, with some new twist that we have introduced. Some history, so the first version is a paper by Yuda Lindel and myself. We published in uh, CCS 2015, and then we made an extended version with uh, joint forces with Adam. And uh, we just posted this as a, as a draft for the CFRG. And uh, what we did was we added the 256-bit uh, uh, option to you know, look for the future and some other things I'll explain. So the features are well, first, you get the non-misuse resistance. I'll explain exactly what I mean by that. It's easily deployable because, first of all, there is code available. But uh, you can actually use hardware and software primitives from AES GCM, some functions. You can just reuse them if you wish. There are no patents attached, and it's uh, publicly available. There is a GitHub where I, I posted code in all versions that I could thi think of. So a reference code just requires nothing, optimized assembler, a Mac OS assembler, and also a C intrinsics version, more or less with the same performance. Of course, you cannot expect C to compete you know, to the 100% with the hand-tuned assembler, but it is quite close. Um, and uh, soon it would be integrated into Boring SSL. Boring SSL is the Google version forked from uh, OpenSSL, 
that is maintained separately. Um, all right, so in a nutshell, we're ready to go. So first of all, I'm, I'd like to tell you that, my, that ASGCM has been my favorite for years, and I've invested a lot of effort in trying to tune it and optimize it. And this is just some, some uh, performance numbers in cycles per byte, so lower is better, of AES-GCM. So in the beginning, it was not very competitive. Before you had uh, instructions for AES and for polynomial multiplication, uh, um, it had to be implemented with lookup tables and it wasn't very fast. So it wasn't a, a, um, a competitive proposal compared to, for example, um, RC4 and the SHA-1 HMAC. So, until, so this is what we're talking until around 2009. With the first uh, generation where the AES instructions were introduced, there was also an instruction to do a polynomial multiplication. It is called the carryless multiplication. And together, this jumped from 22 cycles per byte to three, around three cycles per byte. Then in the next generation, there was some more improvement. These are all combinations of microarchitectural improvements. It's, these are the same instructions. It's just the way they are implemented by the processor and improved uh, software optimizations. And as you can see, in 2013, the Haswell generation, it's around one cycle per byte. The next generation was uh, three quarters of a cycles per byte. And the latest is 0.65. And the 0.65 cycles per byte for ASGCM encryption is very interesting because this is the first generation of processors where you can get the same performance for the authenticated encryption uh, compared to just the counter mode uh, encryption. So this is actually the best you can hope for uh, uh, this kind of authenticated encryption. So this is wonderful. And then you'll ask, so what's, what's missing? Okay, I'll just tell you we, what are the instructions. These are the AES and I, I think many people know already what they are. The carryless multiplier Polynomial multiplication is a, an accelerator for the G-hash portion of the AES GCM. And you saw what uh, all of the codes that I describe here with, the, with this, uh, this performance are already in OpenSSL, contributed to OpenSSL and to the NSS uh, libraries and, of course, in the boring SSL. So what's missing if everything is so wonderful? the non-misuse resistance. So here is a sketch of how ASGCM is working. And what is important is that if, to notice here, if you repeat an IV, a nonce, then it's a disastrous, uh, it has disastrous implications in both the privacy and the integrity. Because the same, if you're using the same keys, of course, so, because the IV is used, the way it is used, first you derive a hash key, and then you set up an initial counter which consists of the IV, and then one, you start with, uh, with something, and then you do AES in counter mode, in a sense, and at the end you apply a G-hash, a universal uh, polynomial evaluation, universal hash function over the ciphertext, and then, you mask it, you XOR it with the AES of, of, uh, of some uh, mask. And of course, the counter blocks and the zero and the mask all have to be distinct. But if you repeat a nonce, then they are not distinct anymore, and then you lose both the integrity and the privacy. So what is our goal here? Why not enjoy both worlds? Let's make up some algorithm that will enjoy the hardware and the software support, everything that AES GCM has to offer, but with nonce misuse resistance. And let me state exactly what I mean by nonce misuse resistance. You input, you input plain text and uh, AAD, and you expect uh, ciphertext and, and a tag, and this is the property we want. If you're using if you input the same nonce and the same mes uh, message, of course you're going to get the same ciphertext. That's uh, an in inherent uh, property of deterministic algorithms. Otherwise, if you are using a different nonce or a different message or both, then you get the full security of the authenticated encryption. Unlike the GCM where if you even once repeated the nonce and you lost 
you lost privacy and authenticity. So this is what we want to do. So is it possible actually to, to get this, to, to enjoy both, to, to have the cake, to eat the cake and have it? So the answer is yes, and this is what I'm going to uh, explain here. So any questions until now? Because this is just the introduction and motivation. Um, so how about this? This is just because I'm going to use this terminology. So polyval is, is a universal family of hash functions that is defined as follows. It, it is actually a polynomial evaluation of a string, of a, of, of a set of strings of uh, 128 bits. And it looks very similar to the G hash of ASGCM. But since we were to define something new, it was time to actually correct something which is very annoying in the definition of ASGCM. Uh, so it's not, so polyval and the G hash of GCM are not exactly the same thing, but they are built on the same construction. So it is a polynomial evaluation over GF2 to the 128 with some polynomial reduction. Now I'll show the relation between this and polyval and G hash. So in G hash, there is one word that, uh, that is very annoying and leads to some problems, is that uh, when you are multiplying in the field, this is the multiplication in the field, then you are expected to do computations in GF2 to the 128 with some specific reduction polynomial. But there is a small comment that the order of the bits in the bytes is also rever reversed. And this seems like a benign comment, but actually what it says is either that you need to take the ciphertext and flip them before you input them into the G hash, or, and then, or, or that the field that you're operating in is not GF2 to the 128 with this reduction polynomial. So there is some discrepancy in the definition. And the discrepancy is not, cannot be avoided by just, say, by just, uh, by just saying that uh, the bits are reversed because the way that AES is defined is through bytes and the order of the bits within the bytes of, of the AES state is defined in a way that, that is opposite to that of uh, AES-GCM. That's a fact, so it's about time to define it differently. So if, if this is the definition, uh, if definition of ASGCM, then polyval uh, in GCM sieve is going to be the following. This operation is actually not a multiplication in the field, but actually a, I'll call it maybe some kind of a Montgomery multiplication in the field, but the field is a different field. It's a different uh, representation of the polynomial, and if you notice, it is just the same polynomial here, but in flipped order. And this organizes everything. So there is a really straightforward relation with this, left as an exercise. So polyval of a string with the key x times h, h is the hash key and x is the element in the field, is like doing the g hash, where you byte swap all the inputs and then you byte swap all the bytes. So if you have a routine that does G hash, you can use it to do polyval and vice versa. The nice thing is that in, po in the GCMC, we don't need really to multiply by this, uh, by this uh, key because we directly consume, the polyval already consumes the um, hash um, key without shifting it to the left. All right, so this is just, uh, so now finally we come into the what is ASGCMC? So you get some input message, AAD, you have two keys, K and H, H is for the, is the, is the hash key or authentication key, and a nonce. Now, first of all, the message needs to be padded. How it is padded? Exactly the same way as uh, ASGCM, you pad the AAD and the message up to the next multiple of 128 bits, and uh, and also you pad to this uh, one, wh what I call the len, len block. This is, this is an, an encoding of the length, of the total length of the AAD and the, and the message. And this is exactly the same as in ASGCM. And then 
first thing, unlike, okay, in GCM you first encrypt and then you apply the hash function over the ciphertext and then you encrypt it. Now here it's the other way around. So first of all we apply the polynomial evaluation hash or actually the universal hash function on the combination of the concatenation of AAD message and an ENCH block. So this is a unique encoding. Now we derive what we call the record encryption key. So we take the nonce and encrypt it. That's, and this is going to be the key that is, will be used for the, um, for the encryption. Now the tag, the authentication tag is actually the encryption with this record encryption key of the value we got from the universal hash function, sort with the nonce, we set the top bit to be zero. We'll see immediately why we do this. And uh, so we, we just have 127 bits um, from this and another bit, so we just have an AES block. So this is the tag. In the counter block, this is what we are doing. We set this, the top bit to be zero. So now you see that the tag is, um, is a, is the output of encrypting with whatever it is and the top zero bit and here is a top one bit so we have a separation. And now we use uh, uh, the 95 bits of the tag and then here is something. Now we increment a counter. Now in ASGCM, in ASGCM if I go back here, there is also a all right, I didn't write this detail. Okay, so here is something, uh, here is the twist. We, we do not zero. In ASGCM, you would take the, th uh, the low 32 bits of, th of the counter block and zero them and start the counter from zero. Actually, from, from one. But here we don't clear them and we just add the index of the, of the block and of course we just uh, add modulo two to the 32. So we are happy to do up to two to the 32 uh, minus one blocks. In GCM it is the same, it is up to the two to the 32 minus two blocks, but this is a, a small thing. But here is, the, here is the idea. Since we don't zero the, the counter to begin with, and we, we get the following benefit. If the usage, if your usage is that you're encrypting messages that are all shorter than two to the 32 blocks, then the security margin increases because whatever you got from, the, whatever em entropy you got from the encryption here of the, of the hash function is going to count uh, to your favor. So actually with this we are getting even better security bounds than AES GCM assuming that the usage does not encrypt messages that are as long as two to the 32 blocks. And if this usage does encrypt messages or we don't have the, er, any restriction on the message uh, length below two to the 32 minus one blocks, then it is the same as ASGCM. And now the rest is easy. You just encrypt with the record, uh, you en encrypt with the record key the counter block, sort it with them. This is counter mode and, uh, and that's it, okay. This is a small uh, triviality about the length because uh, you, if the message had to be padded, you need to deliver the ciphertext to be uh, exactly the same bits as the, as the input. So that's it. Um, I would just like to show, okay, so what, what do we get? What do we get for the 256? We wanted to upgrade bit. This is a little bit more tricky. The, the input is the same. We can apply the polynomial evaluation hash and get the same thing. But now, how are we going to produce a record encryption key with 256 bits? For the 128 bits case, it's easy. We just encrypt the nonce and we get 128 bits of output and we're happy. This is the new key. But how are we going to do this when we want to derive a 256 bits key? So we had. Well, we had uh, we had some mechanism, but eventually we just updated it because it was confusing. And so here is what we are going to do. So we need a record key of 256 bits. So the top pa pa uh, part would be the AS of the nonce. And then to get the low part, we are going just to uh, encrypt 
uh, this uh, record key, and then we have a, uh, like this cascade is going to give us 256 bits for the encryption. So here AES means AES256. And the rest is the same thing. We separate, so the tag is generated by producing something, uh, by encrypting something where the top bit is set to be zero. Here it is set to be one. So we are absolutely sure that this is, they are uh, separate and this is the same encryption. And uh, we are getting a 256 bit uh, version of ASGCM sieve. Now, Let's, uh, let, let me just uh, show one, okay, so, uh, okay, there is a nice flow, but let, let, let's go here and let's realize, so what happens, what happens if you're using the, the same nonce twice? So wha what would happen? Um, you will get the same record key, so if the nonce repeats. So this means that you're going to, uh, so the, the tag is going to depend, of course, on the message. If you are using the same nonce and the same message, of course, you're going to get the same ciphertext. That's obvious. But if you're using the same nonce and a different message, then the value t, which comes from a polynomial evaluation hash, which is a universal hash function, is likely to be different. What do you mean likely? Okay, this. Uh, this depends uh, in the same way as, as a, in ASGCM. It depends on the length of the message, which means how many roots a polynomial has in the field and, and so forth. And we have an expression for this. And uh, so, okay, you ask, why do we invest the effort of, of deriving a new record key for each record encryption and not use the same key as in ASGCM? So here is basically roughly, roughly the, um, the rationale. Uh, we are using here actually 96 bits of an IV. Practically it's only 95 bits because, because we set, we forced the top bit to be one. So with 95 bits of an IV, which is randomized by this uh, universal hash function, we are going to get collision a disastrous collision after doing this two to the 48 times. Now, if we want to adhere to the NIST bounds that apply to the AES GCM when you are using a random nonce, this would limit the number of times you can use the same key to two to the 32. So this is why we say, you know what? We will derive a new key for each, a new record key for each encryption and this way, we could meet the NIST bounds, the NIST security bounds, with much more usage of the key, actually two to the 48 times to use the, to use the key. So if you take ASGCM and use a random nonce, then you should not do this, you should not use the key more than two to the 32 times. And here you can just go up to whatever you want, uh, two to the 48, actually even even more, and this is why I'm saying that we uh, get actually better security bounds than in ASGCM. Here is a nice picture of the same thing. I don't know what was easy, easier to follow, but you see the, the flow, and I would like to show, how about some, what? I'm done? At 10 minutes? I can retire by then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, I thought you said stop. Stop, <laughs> okay, 10 minutes, okay. So uh, performance, how about performance? So this is in cycles for buy. Smaller is better, of course, and I'm just giving you three generations of processors. Haswell, my nickname for this, Broadwell and Skylake, that's the, the latest. And here is for encryption and decryption. So let's take the latest one, one kilobyte, two kilobytes, the asymptotic value that you can see here is, is less than one cycle per byte, 0.95, 0.94. And here, surprise, surprise, for decryption, you can get 0.64 or 0.65 cycles per byte. So for decryption, AES-GCM Civ and AES-GCM Classical get the same performance. And you see this wonderful performance. For encryption, they don't. And this is the one thing that this construction cannot do and GCM can. Because of the construction of GCM where you first encrypt and then you apply the hash function, 
and you have to never repeat the nonce. Because of this, it is possible to actually parallelize the encryption and the generation of the polynomial evaluation. But if you want nonce misuse resistance, you first have to go over the message and compute the universal hash, and only then you can start encrypting. In decryption, it, does, it is not true anymore because you can just start decryption and at the same time roll in the polynomial evaluation. So this is why the performance here is on par with AES-GCM. And here it is like, exactly like AES-GCM if, if you don't parallelize the encryption and the polynomial evaluation hash. It is funny that this trick of doing in, in GCM actually came from me to parallelize these things and I push this to open SSL and eventually it writes back. But this, I said, this gap between nonce misuse resistant AEAD and uh, AES GCM is inherent to the construction. You, can, you cannot uh, uh, bypass this. You cannot parallelize the encryption and the generation of the polynomial evaluation. So here, I just wanted to just, okay, you would ask, and what? Okay, for uh, 256, you have wonderful results. I think in decryption, you get uh, less than one cycle. Of course, it's, it's like taking the, the other results and multiplying the by them by approximately 1.4, right? That's the difference between AES 256 and AES uh, 1.28. I'm just giving a few numbers to show what happens in short inputs. So one block, two blocks, and Four blocks is just for in how many cycles you can get this in uh, uh, 128 and 256. So this is, I don't count anymore in cycles per byte. So I just repeat the number uh, of cycles. This is still better than, than what the AES GCM uh, produces um, for short uh, messages. But that's a different uh, issue. Uh, security bounds, okay, there is a paper. We are going to update to write a new paper with the improved security margins, but as you can see, basically, <laughs> this, this theorem is, uh, is uh, from the CCS 2015. Actually, it is uh, almost equivalent to AES GCM security bounds where the nonce is chosen uh, randomly. But we are going to even improve them with the new key derivation. And that's it. I'm done. This is the repetition of the same oil. And I think that uh, we can uh, stop here. And if there are questions and comments, yeah, I'm on time. Okay. <coughs> okay, so the way this works now is um, we originally had 10 minutes scheduled for questions, but Shai has finished earlier, so we actually have more time. Uh, if you want to make a comment or ask a question, uh, what you're supposed to do in IETF meetings is kind of form a queue. Uh, and then the first person in the queue takes the mic and has a conversation and then goes to the back of the queue uh, if they want to follow up. Or if, they, if it's a really important follow up, they can ask people in the queue to kind of take precedence, right? So it's a little bit complicated. It's not just a case of putting up hands in the audience, but it's to try and make sure that everybody who wants to ask a question uh, it's apparent how many people there are and things get served in the right order. So if you want to ask a question, the thing to do now is, is to come here and, and grab the mic from me and ask your questions. And I see Atul coming, I see Philip coming. That's great. And oh, many people coming. Very good. Okay. Now, um, yeah, so over to you. Try and take minutes of these questions, okay? All right. Uh, my name is Atul Lux from uh, University of Louvre. I'm just uh, trying to understand the, um, um, the statement that uh, you're saying that the, the bound is better than with, uh, yeah, the bounds are better. So uh, is it, you're saying that the bound is better when uh, you're using random nonce ASJCM or?
So let, let me explain what I mean by better security bounds. So first of all, if you take the AES GCM as it is, AES GCM SIV as it is, then, uh, then the, and the messages can be as long as two to the 32 blocks. So multiply this by 16 to get it in bytes. Then the security margins are equivalent to those of AES GCM. It's the same, regardless of uh, how you choose the nonce. That's, I'm talking about AES GCM with 96-bit uh, nonce because if you take an arbitrary long nonce, then, then security bounds are, are lower. Now, but now in our twist, what we do is we don't clear, we don't clear the low 32 uh, bits of the counter block, and therefore, if your usage is encrypting messages that are shorter than, let's say, two to the 20 blocks, then the remaining 12 blocks, uh, 12 bits that uh, that are here, are going to give you 12 more bits of security. So, and this is not a property that you're getting from. Uh, from uh, ASGCM. Is this for integrity or for privacy? Mm, okay, it, it goes uh, for the integrity, integrity bounds. For the integrity but bounds. Actually, I would say that counter mode should be also doing this. There is no reason in counter mode to clear the 32 bits, to, okay, to start the counter from zero and not from whatever you want to do. Mm. Yeah, that, that's the statement. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, ah, same question. It's just uh, there's a competition ongoing, a Caesar competition to to select new uh, authenticated encryption algorithms. So we're just wondering why take something else and not wait for the end of the Caesar competition to standardize whatever comes out of it. Yeah. First of all, uh, first of all, the reason that we did not submit this to the Caesar competition is very easy uh, to explain. We were late by a year or something. It just came up, <laughs> came out out later. But I just wanted to emphasize, and I think I emphasized this in the mailing, we are not mailing list, we are not trying to compete with Caesar, maybe Caesar would output something wonderful, we're just saying ASGCM today is almost everywhere ubiquitous and you might as well, without paying a lot of performance, you can just actually switch the order in which you are doing the, the uh, polynomial, the hash function and the encryption and you can get this. So I don't see that it collides. If somebody comes up with something better, faster, more secure, yes, wh why not? So, uh, um, so, so <laughs> hi, my name is Philip, I'm from EPFL. Yeah. Um, so one more thing that I, I don't understand that much is because for TLS, with this new nonce derivation, you don't really need a, a, a nonce misuse resistance scheme, right? Because you you would, so for TLS 1.3, we will derive the nonce from the shared yeah. secret yes. and, the, and the record number in a deterministic way, so you can actually ensure that if the, the implementers don't screw up and that they are not uh, using random nonces and so on. So you can never assure that implementers don't screw up. But, uh, okay, but, but you're right, and I think we also this question was raised in the mailing list and we answered, if you are sure that the uh, announce will never be repeated, then you're fine with ASGCM. I mean, there is nothing wrong with ASGCM except for the whatever fear that you might uh, by chance repeat a nonce. So if you, your application is absolutely sure that a nonce will never, re never uh, repeat, then ASGCM is wonderful. That's how I started, that ASGCM is a wonderful thing. Thanks. So I've got a couple of questions for you, Shane. Yeah, right. um, so one interesting feature of your scheme is that uh, it's actually a, an instance of a Mac then encrypt scheme. Right, uh, and then and okay. then the issue yes. arises of how do we make sure thinking about implementers not screwing up, how do we make sure that um, there's no premature release of plain text? Now, obviously, in your implementation there isn't, but in in a, in in Joe Blow's random implementation of this scheme, which will appear on the internet in due course, okay, there's a risk here, isn't there, that yeah. um, you'll just decrypt and then output the plain text or ignore the result of the uh, of the Mac verification. We've seen examples of that. Yes, in practice already. I've seen examples. Yes, okay, so um, what can I say? It has to be implemented uh, correctly. Um, and now, the fact that we are doing first the, it's not the tag, the tag comes, at the, but the polynomial evaluation or the hash of the, of the message first and then encrypt it. Uh, we have a proof of, of security, but now if you just decrypt something and you don't check the tag, then. Or you, you check the tag, but then ignore the result. You'd be, 
I mean, <laughs> you're an experienced implementer, right? But there, yeah. there, there are plenty yeah, of people who, who, who can make that mistake. Well, the hope is that uh, crypto would be consumed from uh, well-debugged libraries like OpenSSL or BoringSSL and something. But what can I say? Well, you, you can, you you can uh, screw up in many ways, always. Would you consider adding some very clear statements about this to the security considerations? Yes, I never, of course. I, uh, we, we, I think that we will add uh, something like a disclaimer or warning or something, of course. Okay, thank you. But, uh, I, I'm Bertram from Rony Bochum. I uh, see that you do key expansion in your in each encryption operation. Yeah. Can you comment A, please, on the cost on modern yes. CPUs of, of key expansion, please, because it used to be very okay. expensive. And second, it looks to me like you could actually have the same effect with a tweakable block cipher, so that you wouldn't have to expand the key, but you can just compute your your tweak for that and XOR it in. So isn't this impossible? Like, it, it seems very easy to do that. Uh, it might, I don't, I cannot, I cannot uh, comment on this and analyze on the, uh, you know, on the fly, but I agree that there are many ways to make a non misuse resistant uh, AAD, so it might be. Now about the cost of key expansion. It is not really expensive anymore. I would say it is something around 15, 50, cycles in the latest uh, CPU. And the, this is why we actually took the, the derived, uh, so, so for a long message it is completely negligible and for a short message, okay, you paid 50 more cycles. By the way, I did many optimizations to actually try and, and make the first encryption at the first time, at the, f at the time where I just uh, expand the key, so to uh, alleviate the cost, but uh, I was worried at the beginning exactly from this, but uh, because the f uh, because we added for the 256 version, we added another key derivative uh, key expansion, and it turned out to be a small cost, negligible for long messages and short messages. You saw the table, and uh, yeah, that's it. But maybe there are other and better ways to do this. I I can't say. I um, I'm just wondering about the efficiency. So I've spoken to some people on. Oh, sorry, Jean-Paul de Gabriel and uh, from okay. Holloway. Okay. So I've spoken to some people who are implementing uh, AE modes on uh, smart cards, and they say that when you have crypto processors that uh, are dedicated to do AES, for example, uh, such a polynomial evaluation doesn't buy you much time and efficiency, and that an XOR is as much as a AES computation, for example. So now that the Intel architecture has dedicated AES computation as well, like. How does it compare in computing one block? On a smart card? No, on the on Intel processor. But you have a dedicated, uh, it's integrated in the architecture. We now have, uh, uh, no, what we have is an instruction that does polynomial multiplication of 64 degrees, 63. And you just need to write a, a good uh, software flow to do the, the multiplication in the field. And the AES, you just need to know how to interleave the operations so, such that you can process many of them in parallel, and this is how you get. No, I mean, in timing, the, like, if how much time the timing for computing one AES computation, how does that compare to ex one XOR or one uh, like two polynomials? <laughs> well, uh, the, the, well, I, I, I said so. So AES, the throughput of AES, it's no, you don't uh, do one. The throughput of AES is 0.65 cycles per byte. Now, and uh, if you ask me how long so is for one multiplication, for example, how much would it take? It's, uh, it's again, you don't do one multiplication, you do want to do several of them. This is part of the, part of the, but the if you compute but it so as you go want, along, you so do one um, multiplication. So basically, one but, but you know exactly, actually, uh, I can actually um, give, you <laughs> give you the exact, so you see what is the difference. If you see here, the difference between 0.94 and 0.64 is actually roughly the difference between encrypting and doing the authentication on at this in parallel and just doing them serially. So you see that it is ex uh, approximately 0.3 cycle per byte to do the authentication part. And you can actually measure if if you go and, and measure the public code that I posted and you just do AAD equals 8 kilobytes and plain text equals zero, you will get this number. So just by this experiment you'll know. Uh, um, you could evaluate the cost, the relative cost of the authentication versus the encryption, but you have it from here just by... So uh, roughly the multiplication is half a year. Yes, I wouldn't say, I would say that the throughput of the 
or the throughput of the encryption is roughly two times of the throughput of the authentication. I wouldn't say it in the words that you said, but yeah. That's Thank you. Um, Kenny Patterson, again, from Royal Holloway. <laughs> oh, right. um, I noticed that uh, you seem to only be defining a version here for 96-bit nonces, oh. whereas uh, GCM uh, allows variable length nonces. Now, they're not widely used in practice, but they could be. Does that not mean that this is not really a drop-in replacement for GCM, but only yeah, for okay. GCM with 96-bit so nonces? First of all, first of all, the inclusion of, a, of an arbitrary length nonce actually caused degradation in the security margins. First of all, sure. in the spec, there was a mistake in one of the lemmas, and then it was the first time that the NIST spec was <laughs> refuted, and the recommendation of the Iwata and, uh, was actually use a 96 bits uh, nonce. And the last thing I wanted to do is to step on, <laughs> on the same, so, uh, on the same uh, problem. So we are... Uh, I don't, uh, we are using uh, we are using um, uh, 96 bits or, uh, random IV. It is randomized through the hash function. So basically, what we are doing is equivalent to to ASGCM with a random nonce of 96 bits. Okay. One more question. Um, can you show the pseudo code for encryption? Again? They show what? The pseudo code for encryption. So uh, encryption? Yeah, you had it on a slide. Oh, yeah. sure. Thank you. There. This or no, 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 the pseudo code. code. Okay, okay. Yeah, there. This one. So, he, um, in GCM, if I recall correctly, yeah. the hash key is derived by encrypting the all zero block. Yes. Whereas here you have it as a separate key in proof. Yes. I Could you explain the rationale for that, and also yeah. explain what difference that makes for the API from the programmer's perspective? Well, yes. Okay. So first of all, we separate between the encryption key and the hash key. Whereas in GCM. Actually, I read carefully the paper by McGrew and, and Diego, and they actually said that you could do it this way, but they wanted to save. So in a sense, they take a key and they derive H, which is the hash key from encryption, encrypting AES of zero. Yeah. And this is why the counter needs to start from one. And actually, this is why you can encrypt only two to the 32 minus two blocks. So it's a different thing, and we thought that uh, if we start from something clean, we might as well, just uh, a choice, make, make a distinction between the encryption key and, the, and the, the authentication key, and pay whatever it is in the API. Of course, you just need 128 extra bits, right? Because you, whatever you have for the encryption key, and 128 bits for the authentication key, from the performance viewpoint, it doesn't really matter for long messages, for short messages, actually because of other properties of ASGCM sieve, we are faster than ASGCM. Of course, the cost of the API is there. Right? So, okay. so from the point of view of a programmer, what does he or she have to pass into your function? Does he pass ah. two keys or one key? And then so is it split inside? A pointer to the AAD, a pointer to the message, um, um, the length in bits and uh, of the, uh, the AAD, the length in bits of the message. S well, okay, the authentication key and the encryption key, and then ons. It's the, it's the same API as ASGCM, just no, another. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's what? not the same API as ASGCM. It is. We have an additional input, which is the uh, the hash key. Yes, it is, the, it, is, uh, it is the same as the ASGCM plus uh, another key. I think we misunderstand each other. Okay, so, now, so, so, now, so now you're saying we really have to educate another generation of programmers no. that they should have another input to their encryption algorithm, which is the, the hash key, or the MAC key in this case. Whereas AAD, as an abstraction, only requires one key as input. You're changing the API that programmer, uh, the programmers no, will I have to you. use here. Well, it's, how do you do this for a cha-cha and poly? Uh, that's not my concern here. You're talking okay. about replacing ASGCM with something better. I'm saying you're, I'm saying you're yeah. potentially creating problems. It's uh, okay, whatever. That's uh, I don't know how to address this uh, now. In theory, in theory, we could tweak it to have only uh, one. But okay, consider it as the, as if the key is 256 bits or 384 bits. Okay, and then you split the key inside your. Yes, you split the key. 
I don't think your draft currently reflects that way of thinking, and I think it might be helpful. Well, I didn't think about that. I didn't no, think but, about this, but... But uh, these are the kind of details that really matter when uh, okay, we, we so want implementers to be easily able to use our constructions, right? That's a good uh, comment. We will add this uh, comment. Okay, thank and you. And if there is, you know, if our hands are twisted, we could make it with one key, but, but it's ugly. I think, <laughs> I think it is uh, whatever the ASGCM did was, I didn't like it, you know. The trying Park to Cornell University of Leuven. Follow-up question. So, upon on Kenny's question. So, what if then developers just make H equal to K? H? That's what they will do, right? If you oh. they don't have a second key, they will just copy the key again. Is that okay or not? All right. All right. So, just first of all... Just like a developer. I can do it. Uh, first of all, it's a wonderful question f to analyze from the security viewpoint. And I think, but I have to really write the proof, I think that nothing is going to happen. Maybe it will change something in the, in the bounds. But, but I am... Uh, I, I don't, don't know. Need this, the this, other needs, key, right? this needs careful analysis. What are we going to lose from that? to think about this. It's, it's interesting. Uh, Bertram again from Grone um, Bochum. Can you tell me about the key length? So, so is this mode designed against 128-bit security or 256? Or okay, can you mix and match? Because it seems like the H length will be countered again in, in the 128. All right. The length of the authentication key is 128 bits. And the length of the encryption key can be either 128 for this version or 256 for the, uh, for, for this version. So because you don't, for the authentication, the, the security proofs from the authentication are information theoretic in a sense. And uh, we didn't think that you want to actually make a 256 bit uh, uh, hash key for the 256 uh, bit uh, encryption. But by the way, that's the way it is also in uh, in uh, ASGCM. You derive the the, the hash key is always uh, 128 bits. Okay, this is true, and this imposes the limitation on the maximum message that length that yes. you can encrypt. It in. uh, this is a bound that you also hit. Yes, yes, because the because if you are using a polynomial evaluation hash then the number of roots of the polynomial is a limiting factor. And if you, the num so, so this thing comes into the security bounds. Um, Certainly, and for this reason, it would be nice to have larger H lengths, which you do not support. Well, Neither does GCM, I know. But by the way, a longer H would mean that you need to operate in a different field, and it would be more costly. Oh, you can do this, certainly, but uh, um, I, I don't think that today the, this, this is re a real limitation, you know, for uh, how, how, lo how long is the maximum uh, message. Okay. Any more questions? We're slightly over time now, but I think um, this has been a very useful discussion. I hope the notes got taken. Um, you've got some things to think about for your draft. Yeah. Um, so actually just stepping outside of this moment, meeting for a moment and making a meta comment, that's very typical of the kind of interaction you have at a, a CFRG meeting at IETF. Somebody proposes something and then people start to chip away at it and make suggestions and ask for changes and ask for the rationale to be explained. So that's very typical of the kind of thing you would see if you came to a, a, a normal CFRG meeting. Um, just before we move on, I'd like to actually personally thank Shai for uh, coming today because he wasn't at Eurocrypt and he flew specially to, to Vienna from Israel to come and give this short presentation and to answer our questions. So please join me in thanking him for making the special effort. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on. Uh, Joel, do you want to just give us a quick overview of what you do better than me? Okay, so uh, next up we have Joel Alwen from IST Austria, and he's going to talk about memory hard functions. And uh, the reason uh, that Joel's presenting this work is it, it relates very closely to the work we're doing on Argon2, uh, the winner of the password hashing contest. Uh, and so uh, Joel's going to tell us about some of the research that's going on 
uh, that's very closely related to that to that work. So thank you very much, Joe. Hello. Yeah, it's working. I think. All right. So yeah, I'm going to tell you about memory hard functions. Uh, and uh, this talk really has two goals. One is to uh, inform maybe about directions that theory is taking, the theory of memory hard functions, and in particular, to get some feedback on the direction that theory is going in and you know, maybe we're going in the wrong direction or some things are good and what more could we ask? Um, so yeah, so this is, I'm looking for feedback on, on, on what we've been doing on the more theoretical side for memory hard functions. And the other thing is that we have some results in particular about argon two. And so I wanted to tell you guys about that. Um, yeah, just so that you're aware kind of, and you can also give feedback on that as to whether it matters, if it does not matter, why it does not matter for the standardization process. If it does, what are the consequences for the standardization? Um, yeah. So some you know, questions you can keep in mind, uh, some sort of uh, sanity check somehow that you can keep in mind during the talk. I'm gonna tell you about the computational model that we've been using to prove things, um, the complexity measure to make our statements, you know, when we wanna say something is memory hard, what does that really mean? Um, and the type of statements that we've been proving. And so, you know, you, you can tell, tell me uh, what you think. Are, are these things too weak, too strong? Are we missing some crucial details? Are there things you like about it? So that's what you, uh, you know, some stuff to keep in mind. All right, so this uh, memory hard functions, uh, in particular for password hashing, uh, started based on this observation that uh, computation is very cheap for custom devices relative to general purpose CPUs. So you have this disparity between login servers and honest users that are probably gonna be using a general purpose CPU, and then attackers who are going to try and brute force these password hashing algorithms to, to launch dictionary attacks, for example, um, and they potentially, if they're willing to invest a bit of money, are gonna use custom hardware for which computation is very cheap. So simply iterating hash functions, uh, for example, as bcrypt does, that uh, somehow it doesn't help alleviate this disparity. So there's this observation, you know, what we'd like are functions which require as much memory as possible in order to compute them. And that's because in custom hardware, it turns out memory is, is relatively expensive. And what we want is that this holds even when in parallel. Why? Because when you build a circuit, you can put multiple cores, you know, the whole thing is a, it's a parallel device. And, um, you know, when I say what does it mean that uh, it's expensive to implement functions, or what, what do we mean when we say it's expensive to implement memory hard functions in memory, what we're saying really is that we want the AT complexity, the area times time of a circuit that evaluates this function to be large. AT is commonly, used um, as an approximation for the cost in terms of resources, like dollars, uh, for a unit of rate for this circuit. Um, so, okay, so Percival, uh, Colin Percival, really like kicked off this whole study of memory hard functions, and uh, he introduced this, uh, this idea of, okay, let's, let's use memory as a way to bring up the AT complexity um, for uh, uh, implementing these things in, in circuits. And in particular, he proposed the following definition. And this is sort of the starting point of theory, of the theory work. Um, and the definition, um, which, by the way, Argon2 also tries to satisfy, and, and generally, we would like a password hashing algorithm that uh, tries to satisfy this in some sense, at least intuitively. Uh, and so the definition says the following. You want a function that's parameterized, has a security parameter, um, n, and you want that this function instantiated with n can be computed on a random access machine in time essentially linear in n, and this is because the honest guy is supposed to be able to evaluate these functions, and the honest guy does not have parallelism. So what's important is in that first line, there's no parallelism, it's just a random access machine. But as a security property, what you want is that they cannot be computed even on a parallel random access machine with some space s and time t, so that the product of the space and the time is anything less than approximately n squared, all right? So the idea is we want high AT complexity, and space is what we're gonna use to approximate the area, and the time is the time. And this should be true also on a parallel random access machine. So this is the definition put forward by Percival that sort of got the ball rolling in this whole area. 
So there's another distinction that I'd like to make, which is between data dependent and independent memory hard functions. So the original um, proposal by Percival was a function, is a function called sCrypt. And one of the properties of sCrypt is that, at least in the, in the, in the straightforward way of implementing sCrypt, your memory access pattern is going to be dependent on the input to the function. Right, so in particular, that this input, it's, it's, it's passwords in this case, and so it's something secret. And so what you don't want is that this, um, your, your memory access pattern somehow leaks through timing information, cache timing attacks, things like that. And in order to avoid that, people have proposed data independent memory hard functions. So Argon 2 in particular has a data dependent and a data independent mode. And what's nice about data independent memory hard functions is that the, access the memory access pattern is independent of the input. And so you somehow make it a lot easier for implementers to avoid these kind of timing attacks. So that's why also in Argon2, we have these two modes. All right, so the rest of the talk basically has two parts. The first part where I'm gonna tell you a bit about where the directions that the theory is moving in. And the second part, uh, so, essentially about proving security um, for different functions, including we're trying to prove security for Argon2. We have some statements here, we have some statements about some other ones, but I, rather than tell you about the specific statements, I kind of want to build it up. I want to tell you about the model we're using and, and what the flavor of these statements are. And then I'll tell you also about attacking MHFs. So we have some um, algorithms for efficiently evaluating MHFs that at the very least in an asymptotic sense are definitely attacks, that we get complexity, AT complexity, well below N squared. And I'll tell you a little bit about them, and so we can try and, you know, together work out what, if any, practical implica impl implications there are of these attacks. So I'll begin with the security statements. And so for that, you know, first thing we need to do is talk about a computational model. And, um, all right, proving complexity lower bounds is very difficult in general, Un unconditional complexity lower bounds. But, it turned, but what's very lucky for us is that most MHFs in practice, practically all that I know of, including Argon2, are essentially, def uh, they essentially are modes of operations over a compression function. So really there's not a lot of other computation going on other than that you're calling compression functions in certain ways with the data. So this is nice for us because we can now model these compression functions as random oracles, fixed input length random oracles, and now we have a chance of analyzing things, all right? But what we, we still need parallelism, so it's not just the vanilla random oracle model, and the other thing is we have to talk about memory, right? We want to so say it's memory hard. So we have to make memory explicit. So we use the following model, it's uh, called the parallel random oracle model, and you have an algorithm, and this algorithm is iteratively invoked. And at each iteration, a priori it's a stateless algorithm, and at each iteration you give it a state, which is essentially the state it output at the, uh, at the end of the last iteration. It's an arbitrary bit string, Right? And then it gets to perform some arbitrary computation. Then it makes a batch of queries to the random oracle. Okay, so this is the parallelism part. It's a batch of queries that it makes simultaneously. Then it receives the responses, performs again arbitrary computation, but by arbitrary I mean it doesn't get to query the random oracle anymore. Right? So this somehow enforces if you want to do hash of hash of hash, you really do need three iterations for that, and we can now talk about the states that you keep in between these iterations. So we've made at least some of the memory explicit, okay? So, yeah, and then at the end of this, uh, at an iteration, the algorithm outputs a state again. Again, an arbitrary bit string, and that will become the new state for the next iteration. So this is, this is the model, um, you know, the input is somehow the initial state, the iterations keep going until the algorithm outputs a special final state and that's considered the output of the computation. So this is how we model algorithms, okay? Um, okay, so we'll, we're trying to prove security statements in this, all right? So here's some maybe benefits, at least from my point of view of this model. It's quite permissive in a sense, right? Um, so we give this arbitrary, non-random oracle dependent computation, we give for free to the algorithm. We're not charging for that, all right? We are also measuring only some of the memory somehow. During this arbitrary computation, we don't really know what memory is happening. We're only measuring the memory in between calls to the random oracles. And um, 
Another nice thing is remember originally we wanted a PRAM, a parallel random access machine. Well, any PRAM algorithm is also a PROM algorithm with no added overhead. So if we prove security statements in this PROM model, we've also got a security statement for the PRAM model. And giving these things t for free to the algorithm is nice for security statements, right? Because we say if we can show that no, no algorithm exists that does something, you know, uses too little memory space time, even in this model, well then it's definitely gonna be true if we start looking really at this arbitrary computation and the details of the memory. So this permissiveness of the model, it kind of helps us for security statements. Um, well, and the other nice thing is we can actually prove things in this model that also helps. So, um, okay. So now I've told you about the model, I have to tell you a little bit about the complexity measures. Like, how are we gonna measure complexity here? Um, and, well, remember our goal is somehow area times time, so, so the product of space and time. So, it, ooh, that didn't come out very well. So, sorry. Um, basically what we're going to look at, if you, you fix an execution in this model, and now you say, what's the complexity of this execution? Well, kind of the natural thing to do is you look, what's the largest state that was produced during this execution, and how long did the execution run? And the complexity is the product of the two. So what's the intuition? Well, how much area are you gonna need, or how many, you know, how much space will you need on a circuit in order to run this execution? Well, you need to store at least the biggest state. You need at least that many registers, because you have to store those simultaneously. And how much time are you gonna need? Well, you know, the number of iterations, the number of consecutive calls to the random oracle. So this is the complexity measure that's, um, that, you know, it's, it's essentially space time. All right, so in this model, this is how we're going to define complexity, and our statements, our security statements are about this with one caveat. So, okay, one sanity check here that you can ask yourself. Um, if I give you an execution and I, and I show you this execution has high ST complexity in this sense, does it follow, this is what we would hope, does it follow that having a circuit that runs this execution has to have large, or, you know, uh, yeah, large area times time product in a circuit. Okay, this is, this is a sanity check. I mean, this is not a formal thing. This is sort of the transition from the formal model to the, the actual thing we want. So yeah, you guys feel free to then tell me about why that's not true, or it is true, whatever. Okay, so um, now we have a, you know, we have the complexity of an execution, so now obviously what we want is actually the complexity of a function, for example, argon2. How do we go from the complexity of an execution? Well, in a pretty natural sense. So, uh, you know, you first have the complexity of a particular algorithm on an input, and the intuition is on input x, algorithm A almost always runs with this ST complexity, all right? And that's sort of the probability of the X ST complexity of the algorithm, blah, 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 but th that's the intuition, that it almost always has at least this ST complexity. And so the ST, ST complexity for a function is you minimize over all algorithms and all inputs. You say, what is the ST complexity of the best algorithm for evaluating this function, and it's on its favorite input? So it's rather worst case, which is good because we're talking about an adversary who's brute forcing passwords, and we don't know much, we don't really know anything about these inputs, and the adversary, we essentially let him choose his favorite password guesses. That's why it was so minimized over inputs here. Okay, but there's, there's one issue that comes up, which was made, which, uh, you know, which is kind of important here, which is that parallelism doesn't play well with a area times time complexity, all right? Area times time complexity doesn't scale well in terms of the number of copies of a function that you're computing. And really, it's not that difficult to see pictorially. Imagine you have an algorithm that computes the, uh, a certain function, and here you have the time and the space that it takes, all right? And at the beginning of computing this function, you need a lot of space. But after that, it's followed by a long tail, which takes a lot of time, but not a lot of memory, all right? So this is gonna give you high AT complexity, high ST complexity. But now if you want to iteratively, you wanna compute a lot of these copies of this function, as soon as you free up the memory on the first instance of the function, you now have all this free memory lying around on your circuit. You might as well use it for the next one. And because you can do things in parallel, you can actually really not increase the time. So you're not using a lot more memory and you're not using a lot more time. And this is actually, this, this actually really happens. In fact, the attacks that I'm gonna show you later very much leverage this. They don't work on a single instance of argon2, they work on many instances of argon2. 
Because even for a single instance, there is a period where you do need a lot of memory. But for a lot of the time, you actually don't. In this, in this particular algorithm, this particular, okay? So, so this is a real thing. So we do need to modify our notion of ST complexity if we want to be making meaningful security statements. And we do it in the natural sense, sort of kind of almost the brute force definition, we're gonna, what I would call amortized ST complexity, okay? We're gonna minimize not only, uh, we're gonna essentially allow the adversary, we're minimizing with seeing what's the complexity of the best adversary on his favorite set of inputs. And we're gonna divide by the number of inputs that he chose to evaluate, all right? So this is somehow, we're, we're sort of brute force defining the fact that this is amortized. And that's what we're gonna work with, this notion of amortized AT complexity. And it, it really is different for functions that we really care about. So our security statements are about this now. So the sanity check now, that you, one thing you could ask yourself is, if I give you a function and I guarantee you that the amortized ST complexity is large for this function, is it true, do you believe now, that implementing a brute force attack on this function in a circuit is also expensive? Not just a single copy. And I, 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 my understanding is this is actually what we want from our password hashing algorithm. Okay, so just to give you an idea of the flavor of these type of security statements, what, how do they really look? What kind of things have we proven so far? Well, for example, for argon2i and the balloon hashing family of algorithms, um, we, we made the following statement. So these algorithms, I, I'm not sure how familiar you, you are with them, but they come with two parameters actually, a memory cost and a time cost, the intuition is that you can scale the memory independently of how much time it also takes. And the statement we have that is that if you fix, say, time cost one, which essentially means tau is the number of times you iterate over memory when you evaluate argon two, right? Sigma is the size of the table that the honest guy builds up. So he builds up a table of size sigma and then he iterates tau times over it. And we show that, well, for any sigma, if you're gonna iterate over memory one time, so this is kind of like when you'd hope for, yeah, okay, what you get is that, well, the complexity, that again didn't come out well, is at least sigma to the 1.6 repeated, okay? So we're not at the n squared that we want, but we're at least at sigma to the 1.6. And by complexity, again, I mean the amortized ST of argon, okay, in this parallel random origin model. And this, this is argon two, if you recall, it actually, the structure of the calls, the modes of the calls to the compression function depends on your salt. So this is not an absolute statement, this is over the choice of your salt, but with very high probability. So essentially for practically all salts, you know that you have at least amortized ST complexity of this for your argon two instance. Argon two I, sorry, it's only data independent. Um, Okay, then we also, uh, you know, in an upcoming work, we have a different kind of construction, uh, maybe more theoretical, where we show that you can, inf you can actually get better than this. Um, so this is, uh, we, we have a particular construction where we show that you get, um, in fact, amortized ST complexity of N squared over log N. So you can actually get really close to N squared. And we also show that, in s remember, the honest guy needs to be able to compute this without parallelism. And we show that, we give an algorithm for computing this function that essentially matches the lower bound for the parallel guy. So we, we make sure there's no gap between what the honest guy can do on his sequential machine and the parallel guy can do with all his extra power. Um, okay, so this is, that was the bit about security statements. Now I'll tell you a little bit about when we, when we s talk about attacking these functions, what, what do we mean here? So the first thing, you know, really kind of to keep in mind here, maybe throughout the entire thing is, when is an attack really a practical attack we should care about versus when is it more of a theory thing, all right? So I'm gonna try and tell you some details about what we, what we, when I say we have an attack, what does that mean? What are we saying? So that you can keep in mind, does this really mean something to me in practice, okay? Um, so intuitively, you know, an attack means you have an evaluation algorithm that beats the honest evaluation algorithm which works on a sequential machine. And because it's an attack, it's for the adversary, we allow parallelism in this algorithm, all right? Um, so yeah, you can think, you know, the, when I talk about the quality of an attack, what I'm saying is I'm taking the complexity of the attack and dividing by the complexity of the honest algorithm. 
All right, so, um, yeah, that actually might be the other way around. Complexity, the honest guy of the attack, sorry. <laughs> so when the quality goes up, yeah, it means you have a better and better attack. Okay, so I need to, we need to maybe modify our notion of complexity because before this complexity was rather permissive and when we talk about attacks and we wanna know is this a real attack, we need to be a little more fine-grained about this complexity, all right? Um, so we've been talking, we've been looking at two notions of complexity which try and capture the following intuition. We want, again, the, the cost of building a circuit and to talk about the cost of running a circuit, all right? Building a circuit is because, you know, we want to make sure that building these chips is as expensive as possible. But if you actually look at how these types of brute force devices are marketed in practice, for example, Bitcoin mining rigs, which essentially do the same thing as password ha hashing, um, they're very often quoted in terms of the electricity consumption, right? Because running the device is, a you know, that's, that's something you're paying all along. Whereas the cost of building the thing, you can amortize over its lifespan. So you do also want to say something about how much it costs to run the thing. And so we tried, we tried to do that, right? We, we tried to develop a, a complexity notion that sort of gives us an approximation of the consumption, electricity consumption of this device. All right, so first of all, for when we talk about the area now, we want to be a bit more fine-grained. We don't want to ignore the fact that we're using parallelism, so potentially we have a lot of these compression functions on the circuit. We actually want to count that. We want to count how many copies of this compression function do you need as well as how, many, how much memory do you need. And the sum of those two things, that's the space. That's the area of the circuit that we're going to use. So going back to this parallel random oracle model, what I mean here is not only is the complexity of a given execution going to be the maximum state, we're also going to add the maximum size of the batches of a batch of calls to the random oracle. If at some point in the execution, the algorithm makes 10 calls in parallel to the random oracle, you're gonna need 10 copies of your compression function on the circuit. So that should get added to the area. Otherwise we could come up with, a, with an algorithm that evaluates, doesn't use a lot of memory, and oh, it looks like an attack, but in reality it needs crazy amounts of, call of, these, of, the, of the compression function on the circuit, so it's not a practical attack. Um, oh, okay, but uh, in this equation that I write here, we're kind of charging the same for storing a bit, like one bit register, as we are for an implementation of SHA or Blake 512 in the case of Argon 2. And that's obviously not really fair. They take a different size of memory, a different order of magnitude maybe even. So we, what's been happening in theory is that we've been using this, uh, an extra parameter that essentially tells you the ratio of these two areas. And the complexity measure is parameterized by this ratio. And the idea is that you want to make this complexity statement somewhat independent of the technology. Um, you know, for different uh, technology for implementing these chips, this ratio will be somewhat different. So it's a parameter and you can plug in the parameter for a given technology and you'll find the complexity. Um, okay, so there it is. We multiply by this parameter R. It's the core memory area ratio. Okay, so as far as energy complexity goes, this is now trying to approximate somewhat the cost of running a circuit, okay? So we are only going to now charge for memory that's actually actively being used. Just because you have 10 gigs of memory on the circuit, if you're really only using during most of it one gig, we don't want to be charging you the whole time for these 10 gigs. So the idea is instead of looking at ST as somehow the area of the entire box that contains your memory curve, we are only gonna look at the area under the curve itself. That's kind of the intuition of what we look at with energy complexity. So instead of looking at the max size of uh, a state and the maximum batch size, we simply, oh, okay, I'll get there in a second, sorry. We have to t talk about the, what's the actual unit of measure here. Um, and okay, so we, we built, when we talk about energy complexity, this is, this is the intuitive unit that you can have in mind. So, okay, I define a, a talk is a certain amount of time that it takes to evaluate the compression function once from start to end without pipelining, okay? And then um, the unit measure is, let's call it milliwatt talk, all right? It's the amount of electricity required to store one bit for the duration of one talk. And so the core memory area ratio is essentially the amount of milliwatt talks it you, you need to evaluate the compression function once. 
And so now we can define the complexity in the parallel random oracle model. Instead of taking the max of the memory of the states, we simply sum the size of the states up. And similarly for the batches of queries. So if at the, very, at the beginning you, make some, you have some huge state and you make a huge batch, we charge you for that once, but if in the next iteration, you're just, next many iterations, you're just storing small states, the next summons will be much smaller. Okay, so that's it for the complexity. Now I can tell you, give you some examples of the type of statements that we've been making. So for Argon, Argon2, and I in particular, we have an algorithm that evaluates Argon2 both with amortized energy complexity and amortized, uh, sorry, with energy complexity and amortized AT complexity with complexity at most n to the 1.75 times log n. Well, that statement there. So maybe one thing to notice is asymptotically, this doesn't look good for our goal of trying to get as close to n squared as possible. So asymptotically, I think it might, it would be fair to call this an attack. But of course the question is, what does it mean in practice? So, These equations just really didn't come out. <laughs> so that's all right, you don't have to pass them anyway. Ah, it's okay, it's, it's, it's fine. So, okay, so in an effort to try and understand what this means for us, practically speaking, for this password hashing, uh, for the password hashing standardization, we actually compute in a more exact sense the complexity of this attack, okay? So this is no longer an asymptotic statement. And you don't have to pass it now, um, because I'm gonna give you a bit of like sort of analysis, like what, what kind of things one could interpret into this. Um, so the, yeah, what does this mean? Well, okay, let's, let's try and argue that this doesn't mean anything for us in practice. Here are some things one might, one might say to that end. Well, for the exact security statement, um, if you plug in, okay, that's point two. If you plug in parameters which we might want to use in practice, right? So a memory table of size one gigabyte, that's the n equals two to the 24, and a ratio R which is derived from actual specifications 2013 uh, technology. Uh, that's the core memory area ratio. And um, if you're willing to do more than one pass over memory, well then the attack doesn't give you anything better than the honest guy. Now, this is one, this is a fair argument. Right? Some other arguments you might make is maybe we need unrealistic amounts of parallelism to run this attack. Remember, it's only an amortized attack, so you really have to compute many instances in parallel, and it might just blow up the size of a circuit to something unrealistic. And third, you know, this uh, AT complexity, right, we're only, we're only looking at charging for part of the computation. There's still this arbitrary computation in between random oracle calls, and maybe our attack abuses that. Maybe, maybe it does crazy stuff there. So I'm gonna address these three points, um, So okay, maybe this, this is kind of a, this is a good point. So let's start with that. Um, so these parameters are chosen because they're practically interesting parameters that we would want to use, right? So okay, the first thing to note here is what are we saying by saying you can do more passes over memory and then the, mem and, and, uh, then the attack doesn't have anything do, do anything better than the honest guy? Well, what we're saying really is, okay, I'm gonna fix the amount of memory that this computation needs but I'm gonna double the computation that the honest guy does to achieve this memory hardness, right? So in a way, we're kind of getting a little bit less ideally what we want. What we want is the maximum memory hardness, the maximum memory requirement for a given of, uh, amount of computation. And so what we're saying here is we're saying, well, for this amount of computation, which is one pass over memory, we can't get the memory hardness we want, so we're gonna add computation without adding memory, all right? So this is, this is what, what this, you know, doing this to take the attack out of the picture, this is what we're really doing here. We're adding computation without adding memory requirement. Um, okay, another thing to be said here is that no attempt is made so far to optimize for specific parameters that matter in practice. Instead, in the analysis of the attack, what's been done is that um, asymptotic, asymptotically optimal values have been used. Now, if we actually go and look at this analysis again for these concrete parameters, um, we have a chance of actually improving the attack in terms of exact security. And indeed, 
just uh, playing around a little bit with some code to do that, to sort of brute force search for optimal values instead of just using opti asymptotic optimal, we end up seeing, well, uh, already the analysis can be improved to needing six uh, iterations over memory if we're gonna use one gigabyte of memory. And, you know, there's potential for this to improve. We, we haven't uh, really, we haven't tried yet, so to say. Okay, uh, another thing is, right, maybe we need unrealistic amounts of parallelism for this. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's try and do uh, a bit of calculation. Yeah, how would this circuit actually look if you try to implement full concrete parameters that we actually wanna use in practice, okay? So Argon2i, the random oracle that we're gonna use, it's uh, Blake 512. And Blake 512, in area efficient implementations in an ASIC, can be implemented in somewhere around 0.1 square millimeters, all right? Say 0.2, but uh, it's about, uh, 0.1 is, is the quote from the uh, uh, makers of Argon2i. Okay, so here's how you would implement this attack. One way to implement this attack, you have a central uh, core, uh, a central ASIC, which is rather big, we'll call it the big ASIC, and it's surrounded by smaller ones, okay? And for this, uh, if you're trying to attack this one gigabyte uh, in memory uh, set of parameters, you want uh, 256 of these smaller chips and this one central chip, all right? And this central chip is going to need about 4,000, two, uh, two to the 12 uh, uh, Blake uh, 512 cores. So this is about 410 square millimeters, all right? This is N not too crazy, modern CPUs are bigger than this. We build chips bigger than this already now. The total mem memory you're gonna need across all ASICs and the entire thing is on the order of about 50 gigabytes. Now I'm, I'm not professing to know enough about low level implementation uh, to really you know, sort of judge this too well, but my feeling is these are not particularly unrealistic requirements. Especially for an attacker who's well motivated, who's willing to invest in password cracking. This is something that we might be able to build with real technology is what I'm saying. Okay, so, uh, you know, just wrapping it up, basically, some questions here is, uh, you know, uh, this attack is neither apocalyptic, nor is it purely theoretical, in my opinion, all right? This is now my opinion, so to say. Um, it could be improved. Yeah, I, I believe it actually could be improved, uh, both in an asymptotic sense and in an exact sense. In, in fact, asymptotically, I think we already, we have something that improves on it. Um, the analysis could be tightened, especially for particular parameters. We could try and optimize for constants. Um, on the other hand, what else could we really use for our, our password standard, uh, for this password hashing standard? Well, maybe the balloon hashing. Right, this is something that came after Argon2i, and in fact, our attack does, in terms asymptotically, does no differently, just as well, but in terms of concrete parameters, it does not do as well. So that might be an option for us to consider. Um, or altogether something new, this theory is pointing towards ways of construction, uh, constructing IMHFs for which the attack really doesn't work, where we really get almost the N squared asymptotic, and maybe we can, we can push that into something more concrete. Okay, as far as the more general question, sort of the direction of the theory, uh, well, you know, that's really what I want to hear from you. Uh, uh, does this parallel random oracle model, do security statements mean anything to you guys? Do you, how can we do things better? Yeah, I think that's it. So we have a little bit of time for questions or comments from the floor. Um, let me ask one. So, uh, Kenny Patterson, um, thank you very much for the presentation. I think it's very informative, and um, I appreciate the the work that you're doing to really try and define good models here. Um, do you think CFRG should pause in its standardization of Argon? I do. Okay. I do. Um, yeah, I mean, I hesitate to say it because I don't want to throw a wrench for no reason into the works, but. I honestly do, I think the theory is, uh, there's very promising results coming out in theory that point towards it being definitely possible to come up with at least algorithms in the near, quite near future, which have a lot more theoretical, un uh, you know, underpinnings here. Uh, that is what I believe. So if I can ask a follow-up question, do you think the password hashing competition should be rerun? once that theory is better established. I think that would be quite beneficial, yes, because I think there's a lot more understanding now. Some of the things that are coming out of the theory is that there's been 
a basic, I don't know how I would say it, let's say, from a theoretical point of view, a basic design error that has been repeated again and again and again in many, in practically all of the IMHFs that were submitted. And this has now become clear. This attack highlights this. And so this is one lesson that we could, you know, could learn from this, and it would be nice to sort of see if we can, you know, push this lesson into something more practical. And I think theory people are not necessarily the best equipped to come up with a practical thing, so it would be nice if we had a competition with practitioners involved to try and bring this theory into something practical. Okay. Bart? Very nice talk, thank you. Bart Cornell, University of Leuven. So I want to get some clarification because if you read, the, there is some work you may not be aware of, of Mike Wiener from uh, the mid 90s on uh, full cost of computations. And one of the, it's, a general, it's also asymptotic analysis. Mm -hmm. And one of his general comments is that memory access times are very important as well if you compute cost. But I never saw this, like how many times you write your memory or the pattern in your memory it seems that if you're going to build concrete designs, this may completely dominate both your energy consumption mm -hmm. and your hardware cost. So um, I know in the context of memory bound functions, which we're talking about, the complexity measure were, was uh, the number of cache misses. I think this might be along those lines. Um, so my understanding is, okay, I have to admit that coming from the theory side, I do not know enough about the concrete memory architecture in ASICs. My understanding is this notion of cache misses is more concerned with layered memory architecture. So missing L2, missing L1, going into slow memory. I'm not sure how relevant that is for ASICs. Um, maybe it is, I don't know. That's, that's all I'm saying. The other thing is that a lot of these functions have, so in the dynamic MHF case, uh, something like S-Crypt, Argon2D, um, I think we will actually get a lot of cache misses as well because um, we're at every single step, at every call to the random oracle, to the compression function, we're calling what has up till that point been, we need as input of what has been up to that point, a random position in our memory table that is very big and presumably will not fit into fast memory. So I think, although we haven't analyzed that uh, explicitly for s crypto argon 2 d I think they will actually also have this, uh, uh, a lot of cache misses. For the static case, it's much harder to analyze, I think, because the entire structure of the mode of operation over this compression function is a priori known to the attacker. I don't know of specific analysis about cache misses. But I mean, just off the cuff, I think if you have random accesses, I don't think cache will help you at all. It will waste your time mm -hmm. because you're just updating it all the time. Mm -hmm. But I guess there is still the point of if you have to access memory and you have a large quantity of data, you need actually to invest a lot in the access network. That's the point mm -hmm. also. The other thing, question is, is um, it was not clear, it was clear to me that you, you have a number of, you said you optimize like for the number of Blake cores, is it a function of your optimization that you say I need so many or you just took as many as you could fit on a chip or is there an optimization? That no, in this particular case, this was actually targeted at Argon2i, but not at the specific choice of parameters for Argon2i. Um, actually, that's not true. No, it was targeted at those particular parameters. So, um, the layout that I showed there was specifically if you're attacking one gigabyte, the, the parameters for one gigabyte of memory. Um, however, I don't think that, I think what one could do is design a chip that would be for reasonable parameters, it would work for all of the parameters and it would still stay a reasonable design of a chip. It wouldn't blow up too much in complexity. But that design that I mentioned there with exactly 256 cores is for a, it's optimal for a, a certain choice of parameters. Any more comments or questions before we move on? Okay, uh, let's thank Joel again. Thank you very much. Okay, so <clears throat> moving along to our third and final presentation, uh, Andreas Hulsing is going to present uh, briefly on XMSS. Thanks, Andreas. Okay, so <coughs> this is uh, work with Dennis Boutin, Stefan Gastak, and um, Assis Mohaisen. And um, 
<coughs> we wrote an internet draft for hash-based signature schemes. So the reason is that they are post-quantum. Um, what's nice is they only need a secure hash function, so any signature scheme needs a secure hash function to compress the message in the beginning. We just get rid of this additional intractability assumption. The security of hash functions is quite well understood, at least for um, if we consider generic attacks, um, then we even got complexity lower bounds for quantum attacks. And the stuff is comp relatively fast. So we've got implementations that can outperform RSA, for example, on the same platform. So <coughs> a brief overview in a Merkle-like hash-based signature scheme, you start with a one-time signature scheme, for example, Lampert scheme that I guess some of you will know. You generate many one-time key pairs, build a binary hash tree on top, and your new public key becomes the root of, the, of this tree, and the leaves are the one-time public keys. Now the, one -time, uh, the, the secret key of the scheme consists of all the one-time secret keys, but as these are just random bit string, you can generate them pseudo-randomly and then just store a short seed. And if we want to sign a message, we are using these key pairs one by one. That's why these schemes are stateful, because we have to prevent using the same one-time key pair twice. And so for example, if we sign the second message, <coughs> then we use the second one-time key pair, generate a one-time signature and put the one-time public key and the one-time signature into the tree signature. And then we also add these nodes, which a verifier later can use given the one-time public key to compute up to an alternative root value, and then if this computed value matches the value in the public key, then the one-time public key is authentic, and then if also the one-time signature verifies, <coughs> then the signature is correct. Okay, so XMSS is um, an improvement of the scheme from 2011. In the tree, the construction slightly changed to use some bit maths, which are XORed before the hash function is called. This allows to reduce the security requirement um, from collision resistance to certain premature resistance. It uses a certain one-time signature scheme, which is some variation of the Winternet's one-time signature scheme, um, which actually has the same goal, so to get collision resilience. And for the message digest, we use some randomized hashing. And um, the goal of all of this is to achieve collision resilience, which is not only nice from a theoretical point of view, but also allows us to, um, to halve the signature size. Because um, the signature consists simply of a bunch of hash values. And so if we don't require collision resistance, we can use um, hash functions with half the output size. <clears throat> then we've got a multi-tree version, which is kind of a CA structure. So we've got simply many trees, and the tree on the top layer is used to sign the root nodes of the trees on the next layer, and so on, until on the bottom layer, the leaves are used to sign the messages. And the reason for this is, um, if you want to do a big number of signatures with one key pair, then you need a tree of quite some height, so you can do two to the h signatures um, with one key pair if h is the height, and um, key generation is linear in this number. And if we do this called tree chaining, then um, <coughs> we can get key generation. We use d layers at the cost of something in the order of um, d times two to the h over d. And it also allows, with some algorithmic improvements, um, to reduce the worst case signing times. Okay, so the scheme which we actually got in the standard now is not the scheme which we published at Pico Crypto 2011. Um, we added something called multi target attack resistance, which means we are keying the hash functions inside the construction. And um, we also use different bit masks for all the hash function calls. Um, this allows us to give a tight security reduction, which in turn allows us to um, select um, parameters such that we get smaller signatures at the same security level. And um, 
So if you're looking for the scientific reference, you actually have to look at our PKC paper from this year and not the 2011 paper. Um, as I said, the scheme we're currently standardizing is stateful, but um, it's the main building block of Sphinx. So like um, for the stateless signatures or the most um, performance stateless signatures that we got at the moment from hash functions, um, we can build on this draft later on. So I will repeat some recent changes that we did before the Buenos Aires meeting. So that's what already made it into the current version of the draft. So we changed the randomized message um, hashing a bit to also get a multi-target attack resistance. So the motivation is um, if you do normal randomized hashing, so you apply H to some randomness and um, concatenate it to the message, then after seeing Q signatures, an attacker just has to find a pair R and M such that matches one of these um, hash values of Ri and Mi. And the reason is that um, the Ri is not authenticated in any way. So the attacker is free to choose Ri. And um, so the security level would actually be for an n-bit hash function n minus log Q. And what we did is we just added the index for the main separation, so the index of the used one-time key pair. So <coughs> the hash function call is now h of ri concatenated i and mi. Um, in practice, this prevents <coughs> multi-target attacks. Um, we do not really have a formal proof, especially there's no standard model proof. If you just take this as a property and analyze it in a random oracle model, it's straightforward to show that this actually gives you some domain separation and thereby um, the attack complexity is two to the n again. Okay, I would jump over this addressing scheme because that requires too much knowledge of the draft. <coughs> We've got some recent changes that we, or like these are the final changes we want to make. So the first thing is currently the draft, um, you can think of these hash-based signatures as kind of a protocol that uses some hash function. And so to instantiate it, you have to select a hash function. We currently get two parameter sets or instantiations, which are SHA-2-256 and SHA-20 -SHA for everything pseudo-random, and one that just uses SHA-2-512 to build all the functions. Um, we were asked to add SHA-3. Um, we were thinking about making SHA-2 uh, 512 optional because 256 bits of post-quantum security seem to be a bit far-fetched. <laughs> and um, we also got the comment um, that we should do a pure SHA-2 256 mode because NIST already standardized this and this makes it easier for companies um, to use this because of compliance reasons and also the code size goes down. And so what we will do is um, have one single SHA-2-256 um, parameter set, which is mandatory, and then as optional, provide a SHA-2-512 parameter set and also two parameter sets based on SHA-3. Um, one of the reasons that we threw out chachas also that we had to change this addressing scheme, which is, so it's used to pseudo-randomly generate all these hash function keys and bit masks used in the scheme. And um, we had to change it a bit such that it also allows to be reused um, for Sphinx later. And um, <coughs> then suddenly ChaCha does not give us enough noun space to actually um, process these addresses. Okay. The last thing, um, which might be, again, a bit more interesting for cryptographers, um, we need this randomness for the pseudo-random hashing. And the standard way to generate this in a deterministic manner is you've got some dedicated secret key value, which is just used for this, and then you apply a PRF with the secret key, um, keyed with the secret key value to the message to derive this R. The drawback is, if you think of small devices, for example, that cannot con um, hold the whole message, you have to stream in the message twice because you need it to generate R and later to actually compute the hash. And so what we can do with the stateful schemes 
<coughs> is we replace the message just by the index of the used one-time key pair. This um, <coughs> allows us to just pro um, process the message once, but it differs a bit from other schemes, so that might be a drawback. And actually, one thing we might will change also, we will add the, the public key to the hash. Okay, that's it. So we have time for questions and comments for Andres. Somebody's coming. <laughs> Hi, Philip from EPFL. Um, have you considered uh, switching? So you, s you said that the cha-cha mutation was too small, right? As far as I understood, have you considered switching to something bigger, like, like for example, the one from Blade Two? Um, no, in this case we didn't, because we already decided that we will probably get rid of this, just because of the code size. It's easier to implement if you only have to implement one function to, um, instead of two. <coughs> so, for example, in our reference implementation, we currently use OpenSSL for um, for SHA-2, and then we've got, in addition, the ChaCha permutation in there, because we also do not use it in the standard way, not entirely. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Any more? No. Uh, Bertram Rouen um, Bochum. So we have seen here that there is still a lot of ongoing research on hash-based signatures. So there's the first uh, publication in 2011, and then you added a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, modifications to that, uh, smaller signatures and, and other stuff. Uh, from your perspective, when is the right point to standardize such a scheme as the FAG point? Or <coughs> so right here? This, this last change, this XMS T was actually motivated by the standardization process. From a theory point of view, the improvement is, is negligible, but you've got these compliance issues that you really need <coughs> security levels 128, 256, and if you're slightly losing, so if you're slightly below because your reduction is not entirely tight and um, there are actually attacks, then this simply looks ugly and people will complain. And people did complain. Uh, sure, my question is more uh, quantum. So the, I think the main selling point is quantum computer yeah. resistance. Uh, quantum computers have not been built. They will be built maybe earlier than five years. So why not standardize in five years? But why, why, why do you think now is the right point in time to do that? Because if we standardize now, so that took now, I think until this is finished, it will have taken something like two years. I would guess there will be one more year until everything is done. Then, until the stuff gets deployed, I mean, companies now start experimenting with hash-based signatures. So I know of some big companies that actually start to do this. Um, until this is out in the field, it will be something like five to ten years. So just to have an option available and for this one, we, we don't have these issues like for, for lattice-based crypto that the security estimates are still kind of moving. Um, <coughs> so that's the reason why I would say do it now, then we've got this option. We definitely would need some um, encryption alternative. I think there it's much more pressing. For signatures, you just need the scheme when the quantum computer is built, because then you could still also in archives um, resign. Um, for encryption, you don't have this. So actually, I would hope that we soon got some post-quantum candidate encryption scheme, which is, which we're confident enough to say, like, okay, for the moment, that's something we could use. Thank you. We're all done. Okay, let's thank Andres again. Thank you very much, Andres. <laughs> again, I should thank Andres publicly for uh, coming and giving the talk. I think he was here at the conference anyway, but he, I did twist his arm into coming along and giving us yet another update on uh, on, on, on the hash based signatures here. So thanks very much, Andres, for doing that. Okay, so now we're almost done. Um, I just wanted to give uh, people the opportunity to uh, ask questions. So this is like the 
any other business uh, section of the meeting. So if anybody wants to raise any issues or bring anything to my attention or ask any questions about CFRG, I guess now is the time to do that. Well, you're all thinking of your questions. Um, maybe I'll ask you one as an audience. Uh, so has this been useful as an introduction to CFRG and what we do? And would you like to see something like this at a future cryptography conference, Eurocrypt, maybe even crypto this year? Yeah, maybe a quick show of hands for people who found this was useful and they would like to see more of this kind of thing. Okay, does anybody want to see less of this kind of thing? People think this is a waste of time. Maybe the people who already left, uh, Quite a few people went, I guess they had flights to catch. That's an optimistic view. Okay, so it's fairly positive feedback there, I guess. Not very scientific, but um, useful to get a show of hands. Okay, so any other business, any other questions or comments? Okay, so um, we've had some note takers busy in the middle of the room, and uh, we'll be posting some notes and uh, eventually on the CFRG website. Um, the next CFRG meeting will be in Berlin uh, in the third week of July. Maybe some of you will be tempted to come along. Uh, so let me just close by saying thank you for coming today. Thanks for making it uh, interactive and useful and um, have a safe journey. Thank you very much.